Hello, I'm Luca Coasters and today I'll be continuing my series in which I review my top 20 coasters. In this video I'll be reviewing my 19th favourite coaster and that is Maverick at Cedar Point, a 105 foot tall intimate LSM launched coaster which opened in 2007. The coaster itself is well presented with the highlights being the rock work and the water effect. The queue line itself lacks details, consisting mostly of indoor switchbacks, but this ride definitely does not focus on the theming. From the original animations, there was more theming present but that didn't end up getting built due to budget constraints. Maverick is one of the most popular coasters at Cedar Point, with it amassing a constant long line, but luckily it moves fairly fast despite the short trains because of the great operations and the six trains used. When boarding, you get assigned to either the front train or the back train in the station, and your row is assigned, but if you ask for a specific row, you would be generally given it. You then board the train, which is very similar to most Intamin trains from that era, and is pretty much the same as the Intamin Hydraulic Launch Coaster trains. This one in particular features Vestar restraint made out of a soft fabric. This is connected to a cylindrical bar which goes over your lap. The trains themselves are not the most open and spacious, however it's not too uncomfortable when boarding. And then, you dispatch and got the LSM lift tool, which propels you to the top at 20 miles per hour. You then disengage from the LSMs just before you crest, and the train dives down a tiny 100 foot 95 degree drop, and this moment is powerful. You are flying out of your seat in every single row, and the further back you get in the train, the more powerful the airtime is. Because of the longer trains, the apex is much larger than most beyond vertical drops, and it amazes me how they still manage to make the drop so short. This gives a completely different feel to most beyond vertical drops as it has so much speed already going into it, and the drop itself is surprisingly violent and it's over much quicker than most beyond vertical drops. The airtime you get in the back is some of the strongest airtime I've experienced, and it rivals moments such as the rolling thunder hill on El Toro for strength. The ride then twists as it enters the first valley, giving some weak laterals and really strong positives which slam you back into your seat, creating a huge contrast in forces as the pullout is so tight. The strong positives persist through the turn until suddenly you are thrown into the side in a really snappy transition, which has some really strong laterals which really push you into the vests. You then traverse another turn which features similarly strong positives. This leads into yet another snappy transition which feels like the previous one. This leads into one last turn which has the weakest positives, which feels like it is around 4Gs and it's the least sustained as it's only a 90 degree turn. Then you rise up into the first airtime hill, which is actually quite similar to the final bunny hills on Goliath. The hill is tall and has a sharp crest, meaning that the airtime is not the most sustained, but it is really violent. You suddenly get pushed out of your seat. While the airtime isn't too strong, it still has a decent ejector, but it's not nearly as strong as, say, the bunny hills on Goliath, or the drop you just experienced before on this coaster. The moment itself lasts under a second and acts as a break to the constant positive forces that were just thrown at you. The following valley doesn't really have the strongest positives, and then you suddenly bank to the right into a 90 degree turn, which has some pretty good positive g-forces. You then rise up into the twisted horseshoe roll. The first roll whoops you around slightly and has decent positives. This element is fun as it's not featured on many Intamins, but it definitely doesn't compare to similar rolls on older B&Ms, which navigate the rolls much faster and whip you around much more. Upon exiting at this element, the train leads into another turn, which has decent positive Gs, but it isn't as crushing as the turns before. This short section is definitely the weakest section of the coaster, but the pacing isn't too negatively effective as the elements are still fun and slightly intense, and after this section, the ride effectively picks up the pace again. The train then pops up slightly into the brake run, giving a brief pop of ejector on the front. You then enter a tunnel and the train slows down to an almost complete stop, but before you even have time to process what just happened, you're launching to 70 miles per hour. This launch is snappy and very reminiscent of Taran's first launch, but this is even more intense than that. It also has a signature LSM vibration on the launch. It feels weird, but it doesn't really detract from the insane launch that you're experiencing. The sensation of speed on this launch is further heightened by the fact that it's indoors and you're approaching complete darkness, which really makes it feel more intense. You then go into the most underrated part of the ride. As you're in the tunnel, you actually can't see anything, and there's a sudden bank to the left, which is better than any of the sudden transitions in the first half, and you violently get thrown to the side. You are then met with crushing positive G's, which is the best moment of positive G's outside of the first valley, and it feels like you're approaching 4.5 G's, which is insane. The force is fairly sustained as you rise up, lasting a couple of seconds, but unfortunately then you enter some trims. This long set of uphill trims notably slows the train down, but it definitely doesn't kill the pace, and these trims are necessary to ensure that the rest of the ride doesn't kill you, as the second half is that insane. You then start heading down as you get a nice brief moment of flow, sir. 
The train then twists to the right as you traverse a long downhill turn which has some great sustained positives, making it the moment on this coaster that I came closest to greying out on. This is very similar to the turns on Desert Race and Rita, and it's great how in the second half of this turn you are right up against the water as the water cannons fire. The train then enters a part of the coaster which is where the Heartland Roll used to be. This element was originally installed on the coaster, but it was deemed too uncomfortable for riders before opening, so it was replaced with an S-Bender instead. This moment gives you a great sensation of speed as you fly between the rocks and you get subtle laterals as you navigate the turn. The train then rises up and while doing so it violently banks to the right, narrowly missing the track from the first drop. This dangle dive gives decent laterals and is really whippy, but honestly I was disappointed by the element. Problem is, while the train is rotating really fast, you don't really feel it because of the lack of laterals. I was expecting something on a similar level to Carnage and Saint Transition, but instead it was more similar to the sudden bank towards the end of Storm Runner. The train then glides out of this element into a fairly intense turn which crushes you into your seat. The train then rises up into another second Stengel dive which is whippier, but it's the same story. Not many laterals. But as this is banked more you get some good positives at the top, and then the train whips out in the other direction to exit the element, overall making for a fun element which throws you around more due to there being two sudden changes in direction compared to there only being one on the first angle dive. The next valley is also really intense and it leads into one final airtime hill which is very flat but small therefore giving a good dose of sustained ejector. The airtime throughout the hill feels like it is perfectly sustained so the strength of the ejector feels consistent throughout. This is very similar to the first hills on Skyrush and the second hill of Expedition G-Force as the airtime doesn't really build up throughout the element, but on Maverick the airtime is notably weaker as the hill is so small yet drawn out and I doubt it's much stronger than minus 1G. Then the train banks to the side as it navigates one more turn which leads into the final breaks. As a whole I love the layout of Maverick but there is one glaring issue which stops me from ranking it much higher and I haven't mentioned it yet in this review. And that is the restraints. I'm mainly talking about that cylindrical bar that goes over your lap. The problem is that it's not ergonomic and the bar doesn't really conform to your legs which makes the airtime painful. This is worsened by the strength of the airtime and crushing positive G's which force a restraint down even further causing more discomfort. Honestly, when on sitting on the brake run at this coaster I couldn't help but notice the discomfort I felt. The vests also restrict the lateral forces, which could be the reason that I was disappointed by the stenkel dice, however that is less of a problem compared to the bars themselves. I'd say the overall solution to this restraint issue is to use the new Taran style lap bars on Maverick. And if they have to, they can just put the vests on that. It's so much more comfortable and it'd benefit the experience so much for me. So taking into account all of my issues with the ride, I'd give it a score of 92 out of 100. It's an amazing coaster in terms of the layout and forces, but it just needs to improve its restraints and then I'd love it so much more. So comment down below your thoughts on Maverick and you know why not like and subscribe.